nor gender or sexuality, but he said, but ground it in what is eternal, not, not impermanent. So that's a whole different concept. The idea that, but there's so many problems when we think we are the body. Um, so, uh, there's so many problems when we think we are a certain race, when we think we're a certain gender. These days, I don't know how many genders there are, but there are a lot, okay? Uh, uh, you know, there, there, you know, I mean, and it doesn't matter, because to Prabhupada, it doesn't matter, because we are eternal spiritual beings that are cognizant and ultimately very loving. So Prabhupada wanted to get literally and figuratively to the heart of the matter. And that's what his teachings are all about. To really begin there, not with the body. Start with the true self and the very heart of your being, and then move out from there. And what you are describing is a time of you know, political turmoil, yes, social turmoil. Yes, it was. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, we come from the 50s, 60s, but it's very stereotypical conservative general. Like right. In America. Right. And then. Well, that broke down in yeah. the 60s. Yeah. Yeah. You know, women became. There was, with the women's movement. Came. Mm -hmm. I was at Harvard when women's studies actually started. Yeah. 1976. That is when it all started. Uh, the women's studies, the whole thing blossomed from Harvard Divinity School. I was right there. Yeah. And it was amazing. I actually tried to understand it. And, uh, you know, I, I went to uh, one of the professors and said, what's the, what's the big deal going on? And she said that when it's just a male-dominated history, you're only getting one side of things. When you get a, a female perspective, you're going to hear other things, like in the Holocaust, uh, for example. You know, the, the concentration camps may be described, but the, the females describe what it's like to walk, and the boots getting stuck. And the men never talk about that. You see, so... You, you know, you're not getting a complete enough, uh, enough history, or as much as we could get, by being so male dominated. So I, I began began to appreciate that. So it all began there at Harvard Divinity School. Mm -hmm. It was quite powerful. Yeah. I, I loved it. I, I, you know, I learned a lot from it, and it incorporated that into my own, you know, scholarship and things like that. So I suppose that this comes at a time. This thinking that you're describing yeah. with, you know, uh, being beyond the body. And yes. In terms of gender, that must have been uh, you know good timing. You know? But also appreciating the unique capacities among the genders. Right. Could you say something more? About that? Well, for example, in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the Bhagavad Gita uses the word buddhi a lot for intelligence, or the way I translate it in my translation, uh, the faculty of discernment, to be able to discern the different values of things. So buddhi is used, and then there's one verse in the Gita that uh, hallows the the seven feminine qualities. These are beautiful qualities of the feminine. And one of them is intelligence, but it's a different word. It's medha. And medha is a kind of intelligence that's different than male intelligence, okay? If we can be categorical here. So, so the, the Gita appreciated that there's something valuable uh, coming from the feminine gender that's different from the masculine and of course, that's why parents are good. You know, you can cover both, even if if it's the same sex marriage. I mean, still, there's generally to wax a little Jungian. There's always the anima and the animus. You know, uh, there's a, you know in the in the psyche. And, a, and Jung said, for a completely healthy, you know, whole uh, uh, mental capacity, you have a balance of both. So the Gita really propounds that. So it's it's pretty interesting. Since so, so, you've talked about concentration camps, my father was in a concentration camp. Oh. His mother, she was killed by the Germans. And oh. so there was one man, my father could be visited by his wife. He saw this man. My father said, This man over there was probably been tortured by the Germans. Tortures that you have and pointed. Then, then he came out after the war, he was away. He was traumatized physically, mentally, from every point of view, hurt and yelling every night. He died shortly after, and uh, when he was dead, his body was dead, it was the undertaker came, and there's some little Catholic here, the undertaker came, he washes the body, and he puts the body into a coffin in one room, decorated, etc. So the undertaker 
came, my mother, mother didn't know. A little louder, so everyone can hear. Yeah. Another beggar came, yeah. my mother didn't know who he was. So she looked into the bathroom and she screamed and fell on the floor and fell out and down. It was the same SS bomb one in the oh, uh, oh. Same person. So I went into the basement and got an axe. So yeah. not me. My brother came to the petrol can and said, we don't be doing something, we kill him right now. And my mother said, and this is the point. She said, nothing will happen like this. He's a husband, he's a wife, he has a wife, she's innocent. And he has children, they're innocent. Mm -hmm. Therefore, now violence will be committed. So much violence has been committed already. This yeah. needs a woman to die. Yeah. Men are ready for that. Yeah, there you go. That's nice. That's my point. Yeah, interesting. Wow, what a story. Um, yeah. And, you know, speaking of violence, the Gita sometimes is very bewildering to read. And we were talking about this a little bit. That, you know, the Bible opens up, it sounds like a scripture, right? You know, first there was God, he created the heavens and the earth, let there be light, right? And that sounds very scriptural. Uh, the four Gospels sound very scriptural. They announce the, the appearance of Jesus, Jesus is God, uh, the Gnostic language of the, uh, of the Apostle John, you know, the Word was God, the Word was with God, right? Very, right? And the, the, the Quran sounds like a scripture with the Shahada, you know, the, all glory to Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, right? Um, the Bhagavad Gita begins with the verse, what happened on the battlefield? <laughs> what the hell? What, is this a script? A lot of students read and start reading and this doesn't sound like a scripture. Yeah. Dharma Kshetre, Kuru Kshetre, Samaveta, Yogyatsavaha, Mama Kam Pandavas Chaiva, Kimapurvata, Sanjaya. You don't understand it, I don't realize, but you hear the rhythm. It's poetry. It's philosophical poetry. It's quite beautiful. And the, it opens up with a blind king in a kingdom that he doesn't deserve, and he asks his minister, who has exceptional vision, unlike his blind master, and asks him, you know, on the field of dharma, on the field of kuru, assembled together desiring to fight were my armies and those of my brother. What, how did they act, O Sanjaya? It begins with a battle, an imminent battle on a battlefield. How is that a scripture? Well, recently, in a lot of my lecturing, I've been talking about it two other scriptures, or three other scriptures, the, the Bible, the New Testament, and, and the Quran, they front load God. God is right there in the beginning, announced very clearly. Bhagavad Gita front loads the human condition, which is more universal. We are all on our own battlefields, okay? I mean, isn't the university studies a little bit like a battlefield, right? Yeah. How many of you stayed up really late trying to finish an assignment last night? Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, she was taking note. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do this to you. But it's a battlefield. Getting an education is not easy. In fact, honestly, if I had known how hard Harvard was, I never would have gone. I, I, they don't tell you how hard it is until you get there. It's really cruel. Anyway, the point is, we all have our battlefields, we have our challenges. And the Gita speaks to that. How do we meet the challenges of just the human life, the human condition? Who are we beyond our condition? With a certain mother, a certain father, certain siblings, certain relatives. You know why they're called relatives? Because they're relatively important or unimportant. Okay? They're not called absolutes. Did you notice that? They're relatives. That makes sense, some of you. Yeah, some of you make sense, right? Well, you'll see the more relatives you have, you'll see. Especially when you marry into another family, you'll see. They're relatives, really relative, okay? So, uh, but, but seriously, relationships can be challenging. Uh, you know, interacting with other human beings can be challenging. The Gita speaks about how to really connect with the hearts of others. That's what we're here to do, is to learn how to connect with the hearts of others. And even though the outer worship here is very elaborate, this tradition that Prabhupada taught teaches us how to worship at the 
altar of one another's hearts. All of this outer stuff is to cultivate the inner stuff. But we need to begin off with the outer stuff. And then we move in. And do you have like rules or how do you know what's, how to do that? Okay, so I mean there's a teaching, there are practices, um, and they're taken up at, uh, you know, voluntarily. I mean, uh, and when you become very qualified, you can be, uh, you know, you receive uh, the induction into the tradition, and then you feel more, you know, qualified and more, you know, uh, energized by the tradition, and uh, you just keep going. Yeah. And amazing things happen, like dropping out and dropping in, and when you shouldn't have been able to drop back in. I experienced that. So, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing journey. It's, 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 it's the extra privilege to really pursue not just the normal everyday life and entertainments and socializing. That's all right, okay? But to actually try to take that dangerous journey, who are we really? Who are we? 